The day of the Lord comes progressively. And this is what we're speaking about, looking at Jesus Christ, who is that day. Many people are fixed on times and uh, when all these things are to be accomplished. This is what the disciples wanted to know. When the kingdom of God would appear, when the destruction of the temple would take place. And it is human nature to want to know when, when, Lord, when. But God has the ages to accomplish all that he is working on. And his home base of operation is your heart, is my heart. He's working on the inner man. So with God, I don't believe it is nearly as important as when, though times and seasons have their place and their importance. But the importance is that the work is accomplished and fully brought to completion. We praise and thank God for all the work that was done at Calvary that our sins were paid for, that we received new life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we can be filled to overflowing with his spirit. This is all a part of the day of the Lord, but there is a fullness of that day when all those things that have been hidden concerning the judgment, the righteous indignation of God against all unbelief, against all sin. Ah, we see what was fulfilled in Jesus at the cross, but we see much sin still in the world. Destruction, death, murder, rape, uh, all manner of inequality. These things will not continue on forever. God is bringing an end, judgment, correction to the wickedness of men in a manifest way. And we look for the day of the Lord, for that day when there will be no more pain, there will be no more death, there will be no more lying, cheating, there will be no more sickness and disease. And beloved, we have this promise that that day will come, the day of the full unveiling of the manifest presence of Jesus Christ the son of righteousness who has healing in his wings, he will come. And yes, as we spoke about in the last message that we did, Jesus is with us now presently, the presence of the Lord, our gathering together unto him, unto his presence, and his his parousia, as the Greek says, his coming is from his holy temple. But there's an unveiling, progressively, a revealing, until that day is fully revealed. So when we look at the scripture, continuing where we have been, 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, the first verse, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the presence, parousia, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So Paul is trying to encourage the people that were fearful, that were worried because of some message that they were receiving from someone, that the day that they were counting on, they were looking for, these people were being persecuted. They were suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. We covered that earlier also in the messages on 1 Thessalonians. Great persecution. And and also in the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians, Paul was encouraging them to continue in the faith despite the persecution. And so they were looking for relief. And we know that in a natural sense, praise God, they did get relief in 70 AD when there was a fulfillment in a literal natural sense in the physical world with natural nations, God did send a day or or he proclaimed a day of judgment that was accomplished by the armies of Rome who came in and destroyed Jerusalem and the Jews. And th- so there was an end to that particular time of persecution. But we have to also recognize 
that persecution still has continued even to our day. So, there's something more than just the historical account there, and we thank God for the historical account that was accomplished in 70 AD. But there is still a need for a further unveiling, a a progressive work that will cause the day of the Lord to fully be accomplished where his judgments are revealed and manifested in a way that will stop all persecution. Amen. That will cause the judgment of the Lord to be so seen evidently, so manifested that all will see him. Uh, Israel was constantly looking. In the Old Testament, we can see that they were looking often for the day of the Lord. And it's spoken just as that, the day of the Lord. Isaiah 2 speaks of it. He said in uh, 11th verse, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon every proud and lofty, upon every lifted up. So in other words, pride was going to come down during the day of the Lord. And judgment came. From nations, natural nations brought judgment. We see that again and again in the Old Testament in the record. The prophet would speak of the day of the Lord, and that day would be accomplished in a natural, literal, historical sense. Again, Isaiah 13, verse 6, Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. Pains and sorrow will hold them, take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. And at many times, they, uh, natural Israel, who is a type and shadow of today's holy people that are born again of the Spirit, not a natural people, but a spiritual people, they were looking for Uh, judgment on the nations that were against them. But many times the day of the Lord would be judgment upon God's people themselves, upon natural Israel, or as in 70 AD, upon the Jews. And we see in Joel, him speaking about the judgment of God, the day of the Lord, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And then he says, down in verse 11, the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? And many times, God would use nations such as Babylon and Assyria to come in and accomplish his work. And that would be the day of God's judgment. That's why he said it'd be a day of darkness and gloominess. Amos speaks of these things. Chapter 5 of Amos, verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? In other words, you're looking for God's vengeance, for his day of judgment against those that are sinners and enemies of Christ, or enemies in this case of the Father. And Why are you looking for it? Because you are going to be judged in God's day and you're going to be corrected. He says, it'll be a day of darkness, not light. It'll be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? It is not very, is it not very dark with no brightness in it? And this is the truth of the day of the Lord. Because while they looked for the fire of God's judgment to be poured out upon his enemy or or upon the enemies of Israel, many times the working that God was intending to do was the judgment on his own people to correct their hearts, to transform them in the inner man. This has been the purpose of God from the beginning. God is not just concerned with natural nations, but he's concerned with the nations that are within the heart of men, condemnation, uh, all the tribulation that works in the inner man. Huh? We have to see God deal with these things that are hidden in man so that there can be a manifestation of the goodness and the glory of God out in the world in nations. But it begins with God's house, his people, 
If judgment begin, let it begin first at the house of God. And so that's even what the prophet Malachi proclaimed concerning the day of the Lord. He said in verse uh, chapter 3 of Malachi, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Well, we know that Jesus did, who was the one that was uh, called the Lord here, would come to the temple that was there in Jerusalem in the days of his flesh. And he says, even the messenger of the covenant, covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then again in Malachi 4, First verse, it says, For behold, the day is coming. Again, this is the day of the Lord, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that they will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And there it speaks about the day, the day star, the sun, of righteousness, not just S-O-N, but S-U-N, because he's referred to as the sun who lights every man that comes into the world. He's the one that brings the light of the truth of God into the human heart and illuminates us. And he becomes the lamb that lights up this city. The city of God is a people. The new Jerusalem is not just a natural uh, physical city here on the earth, but it is the bride of Christ who comes down from the father above spoken of or written of over there in the Revelation. But folks, we have to know that though we can see a historical fulfillment, I believe that the word of the prophet and the word of the Holy Spirit many times is fulfilled and accomplished at least in three different ways. Yes, there's always a historical fulfillment. Though it be in types and shadows and in mysterious parabolic language, God fulfills these things with natural nations. And we can see this in the case of even Malachi's prophet concerning the one that was going to come to his temple, that was going to consume it with fire. Well, that happened in 70 AD. And the natural temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. And that day of the Lord was accomplished in a historical sense, in that day. And we don't have to look for it to be accomplished again in a natural, physical way. However, Jesus also comes by the power of the Spirit into this temple. And he consumes this temple with his fire. He's the one that John the Baptist proclaimed would come after him and would be mightier than him, baptizing with the fire and the Holy Spirit. And he would purify the sons of Levi. That's the ones that are to be his spiritual priesthood. He would purify them, not with natural fire, not burning their literal temple, but you are the temple of God. So he causes you to be on fire with his very presence. God is a consuming fire and he comes to you to make you his habitation through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he purifies you and he purifies you as silver and as gold. Praise be unto the living God. And all that is not of him is consumed. And all that is pure and holy, the righteousness of the Lord, the seed that is incorruptible that you've been born again of, that remains and actually continues to grow. And the enemies of the Lord, all the unbelief in your mind, everything that would stand in opposition to the will of God, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is consumed in you by the power and the presence of of the holy burning of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. So we can see that these things are fulfilled, yes, in a historical sense, yes, in a, a, a prophetical sense or in, in a spirit of prophecy, amen, yet to be fully fulfilled uh, where we can see it. We're talking about manifestly where we can see it in every place, in every heart. And, and this takes place in the fulfillment of the inner man because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Man was given dominion in the beginning. If we want to see 
All the problems of the world solved, it's going to be solved through man. All the problems of the world came through a man, Adam. It was because of his disobedience and sin that we were plunged into this place of sin and sickness and disease and trouble. Uh, now, there is another Adam, the second Adam, the man from above. Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus Christ who came and redeemed us from the curse of sin. By dying on a tree, he became, amen, our propitiation. The, the curse came upon him that we might be made the righteousness of God in and through him. This is the grace of the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And he has greater things to show us in a manifest way than we have seen up to this point, up to this day. As progressively, this day of judgment unfolds. We don't take away from the fact that things were are fulfilled in a historic sense. Thank God for what was accomplished in 70 AD and in many other historical times that we can search out and find in history books that measure up to the word that was spoken by the prophets and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Praise the Lord. But there's also a work that's taking place today on the inner man. So again, turning back to 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. Now, brethren, concerning the, the parousia, parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ has come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So as we've said, uh, that day has been accomplished in a natural sense in 70 AD for that people that lived in that generation. And those that were their persecutors in the external world, the Jews who were persecuting the body of Christ in Jerusalem, they received great judgment at the hands of the Romans during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. However, let us not forget that God's main objective is not to destroy cities and not to bring down natural temples and not to destroy men's life in that kind of judgment. But the work of the Holy Spirit is to judge the internal parts of a man, the heart, the mind, to change and transform his sons and daughters into uh, righteous people into holy members of the body of Christ, that they would take on the nature and the character of their father. And this is a work that is to touch all human life, even those who were persecutors. Paul, the apostle, is a great example of that. He also was a persecutor of Christ. But by the grace of God, he received the message. The mystery was unveiled to Paul. And that day came unto Paul and brought judgment to him. And there was to be a greater and greater uh, increase of that progressive coming of that day. The day star that was arising in Paul's heart is also arising in our heart and is bringing the judgment that is needed. And this is the dealing that has to take place in every human heart. So when we see the scripture here, like for instance in Matthew 24, where Jesus actually is speaking about the destruction of the temple, he says, uh, he told his disciples, do you not see all these things? Speaking of the buildings of the temple. Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And in a historical sense, we know this was fulfilled in 70 AD. We've mentioned that many times in these studies. And there's other things that he spoke of in parabolic language that were certainly fulfilled in a natural historical sense in 70 AD. And he, he sat at the Mount of Olives there in verse three. And he says, they, they ask him, tell us when these things will be. That's always the focus of man is when, and what will be the sign of, of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, said, take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning 
of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And we saw this in a, in, that was parabolic language that was spoken of to warn the people that they would have an understanding of when to flee Jerusalem and get out of the city so that they could save their natural life and their natural skin. But that's not the salvation that the Lord is looking for, and that was a temporary relief of persecution because they could they were continued to be persecuted. For another 300 years, at least, there was severe persecution that came from the Romans themselves. Maybe it wasn't so much from the Jews, but it didn't end the persecution of the Christians. So there's something further that had to be done, and we're not looking for it in a natural, physical sense. God can do it that way if he so desires. But our focus, because the Lord has shown us by the Spirit, that he is working on the inner man. Amen. And it isn't so much when, it's progressively taking place. So if we look at this in Luke, kind of the same things that Jesus was speaking over in Matthew, we look at Luke 17, 20. Uh, we, we mention this scripture often, but I think it's worth mentioning it again here. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, again, there's, there's the question, when? When? We want to know the time. Was it already accomplished? Will it be accomplished in the future? What will be the date? But Jesus did not answer them according to their question. When? He said the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Let that be imprinted forever upon our mind and heart so we can get out of the questioning of when is it historical is it future it isn't something that we're going to observe so much with the natural eye in the external world but this is progressively being done inwardly in a people who god is unveiling the mystery of his presence and his judgments and his working on the inner man where the kingdom of God resides within you. And the authority of that kingdom is increasing. And, and the Lord is allowing the knowledge of the Lord to flood the being of those who are coming to an understanding of where he is and what he is doing. And his great love and his mercy and his grace in a very experiential way, not, not, in a, not in a way of doctrine, in a way of day by day partaking of the body in the blood of the Lord, that communion that is continual. Amen. And we can be partakers of this by faith walking with the Lord by the Spirit. If we go down to verse 22 in that same chapter, then said he to the disciples, the day will the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them and follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under the heaven shines to the other part under the heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. For f but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went into Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now that's speaking very parabolically. And we can see again that from a natural perspective, according to history, we can see a fulfillment that was worked out in Jerusalem, physical, natural Jerusalem in the year 70 AD, when the Roman armies of Titus came in and destroyed Jerusalem, and the people that had heard the message of Jesus fleed. They, they ran out of the city, and they were saved from that siege. And thank God, that was wonderful. They, they got to experience uh, having that word fulfilled 
in a natural setting, in a natural way. However, that did not bring them out of the corruption of the flesh or of the per persecution that probably even came from their own mind, from their own heart. Because we have an accuser of the brethren that's seated right here in this temple, and he has to be cast out. He has to be consumed with fire. He has to be destroyed by the brightness of the coming of the Lord. Continuing there in that verse, verse 30, or in that chapter of Luke 17, verse 31, in that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. So in other words, from a historical sense, when you see these things coming to pass, get out of the city. Don't worry about getting your stuff. The Romans are coming in. They're going to destroy everybody and everything. Don't go down and get your stuff. Just leave. Just get out. Likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife, and you, we remember the story. She looked back. Verse 33, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. So can we see a fulfillment of this in the natural sense in 70 AD? Yes, we could. Because those who knew the word of the Lord that heard that they need to get out of the city of Jerusalem when they saw these things coming to pass. And no doubt they were led by an uh, internal voice. It was the spirit of the Lord that was making them aware. This is it. Get out of the city. Uh, there were some that stayed, not knowing what was going on, not having that inner sense of the spirit. And they stayed and they perished in the siege of Jerusalem. So there was one left and there was another that was taken. Praise God. Okay. However, I think that that is just the surface understanding of that scripture. Because remember, we are speaking about a kingdom that is within. And that's where Jesus started this whole discussion here. Was that the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation, but the kingdom of God is within you. So if you were looking for the kingdom of the Romans to come, yes, you could see them coming in. You could see the authority of the Roman government with their armies. And you could see them take over the city of Jerusalem. And it was something that came very much with natural observation. But that's not how the day of the Lord comes. Not in the true sense of the spirit. This is taking place in the inner man. Praise God. And are there things that can cause you to observe what's going on in people's lives? Yes, you're going to know what's going on by the fruit of people. By the fruit of the spirit or by the lack thereof, by what spirit they're carrying it. They're carrying. You see what is happening, the development, the, the, the rising up of that day, the appearing of and the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ out of the vessel, the burning up, the consuming of all those things that are not of God. We can see the evidence of that in people's lives. But we're not looking for... Uh, the destruction of natural kingdoms or the rebuilding of a natural temple so that it can be burned and consumed with fire or the, so that an antichrist, uh, some man can come and set himself up as God in a natural physical temple. This is taking place in the inner man. When the Pharisees questioned about the time, Jesus didn't answer about dates, but he spoke about where the day would appear and be revealed, that it would be in the inner man. And if we focus specifically on Jesus speaking of he who seeks to save his life will lose it. And he who loses his life will preserve it. This is speaking of those who retain the carnal nature, who desire to save that self-will that is built into man according to their first, first nature, uh, which comes from Adam. They will lose out on the fruit of the Spirit and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you have to... You have to yield your old life to the Lord and let it be consumed by the day, by the fire of God's presence to live in his spirit. Or you just, and another word, another way of thinking of it is you just live in the day, you live in the spirit and you forsake your old life and it's consumed by the spirit of God. There's a man of sin, not speaking of a natural man, but there's a man of sin that's within each of us that has to be consumed and taken away by the brightness of the coming of the Lord in that great day. The new man is... The one who walks in the spirit according to the mind of Christ. So one is going to be left 
and the other is going to be taken. And on the in, in, in the internal working of these things by the Spirit of Christ, the man of sin in each and every human heart is taken out by the coming of the Lord, by the brightness of his coming, by the spirit of fire and indignation that comes from the presence of the Lord that consumes every enemy. The man of sin is consumed, is burned up. He's taken out. He's eradicated. But the precious gold that's been tried with fire, the, the spirit of the living God keeps and preserves the life of he who is joined to the Lord. The new creation man is preserved. Praise God. So there's two in this one vessel. One is left. One is taken. Thank God. The new man born from above is left. He's preserved. He stays it, just as in the days of Noah, the, the righteous one was preserved by getting into the ark, getting into the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the man that is in Christ that's preserved. The other one who seeks to save his own life, his own will, who makes himself as God, he's taken out of the way. He's consumed by the coming of the Lord. Just as in the day of Noah, the unrighteous one is destroyed. Praise God. Again, we'll see this same kind of language used in Paul's writing to the Romans. Verse 15 of chapter 7, For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do or what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do or, or basically what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Who? Sin, the man of sin who dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. That's the man of sin. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. That's the man of sin. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Again, that's the man of sin. Verse 21, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And there's the two natures, or there's the two men in one bed. The one that serves the law of God, the new creation man, and then the one that serves self, that seeks to save the life of self. And think of Jesus in the garden. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass that I know that I'm to drink. And he did know. By the Spirit, he knew that he was to drink that cup of death that cup of suffering, that he had been ordained, he had been born as a man to suffer for the sins of the world, that he was going to be the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the, of the world. And he had to suffer and die the death of the cross to fulfill that. And he said, but now who was speaking? There was another one in him. There was a a man who sought to save his own life. And so Jesus overcame and prayed, but nevertheless, not my will. Whose will? The man that was seeking to save Jesus' life. Not, not the will of that man, Father, but your will. Amen. Amen. And that was the will that was left. And we see that in Jesus. The other will, the man that had the will of trying to save his life, right there was consumed. Amen. Because he gave way to the Spirit. Jesus never sinned in that. He never sinned in that prayer. The Lamb of God was without sin. Totally holy, totally righteous. But he did have the temptation that we have in his flesh. And so we see it perfectly in that prayer. 
and we're able to overcome in him. And the mind of Christ causes us to overcome the mind of the adversary, the mind of the man of sin. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony, and by loving not our lives unto the death. The death of Jesus Christ, the death of the lamb of God becomes our death. So again, if we go back to that little word that Jesus spoke, I tell you in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. And this is speaking not just historically of what happened in 70 AD, but spiritually what is happening in The body of Christ and those who are yielded to the spirit of the Lord. There is a new man that we've been born again of Christ that is doing the will of the father who will remain. Amen. Who will be preserved? Who will see the righteousness of God in the land of the living? And there will be another one who is taken away by the brightness of the appearance of the coming of the parousia, of the unveiling of the fire of God who consumes everything that's not of God in his holy temple. This man of sin is in every human heart but has to be seen, has to be unveiled so that he can be taken out of the way. So again, 2 Thessalonians There, the third verse, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, we will continue with this in a future message Thank God for the truth of his word, the work that the Lord is now doing in his holy temple to conform us to the image of the Son, that we will be just as Jesus is in this world. And he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. You have the mind of Christ. You have the spirit of the living God. Let him be your guide. Let him be your direction. His word is a lamp unto your feet. He will cause you to go in the right way. He will cause us to walk in holiness by his new nature, by the new and living way that we've been begotten again of through this living word. Amen. And we thank God the Holy Spirit keeps us in the truth. We continue to be led by the great shepherd of the sheep. He keeps us on the path of righteousness. Praise be unto God.